Yes. Such a, an example of zeal, oh, Lord God. of love, of inclusion, and of humility. Yeah. We thank you for Marlene. What an example yeah. they've been to us. Now, Lord, we pray. Bless him yeah. as he blesses us. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm thrilled to be, Marlene and I are both so grateful that we were able to come to this. It's been just a great, massive blessing. So many things have been shared here that have been helpful and confirming about some things in our own hearts and lives. And I've certainly been hugely benefited. I'd like to thank John Meek and the team out in the U.S. He wrote me um, some time back and said, we want to help with your airfare. We want to pay Marlene's way. And uh, so we were so blessed by that. Um, it, it just very, it was very, very meaningful to us. And uh, we're both delighted to be here. It's been wonderful to be with our friends, Harry and Wendy and Ray and Sue and John and many others. And, and, and actually, actually make some new friends. So it's yeah. great to meet you all. And, the, and uh, we've had wonderful days in the past with Steve and Heather. Uh, I remember a time in Um Comas over here in the year 2000. Um, we were together in one of Simon Pettit's um, school, uh, African School of Leadership. And um, I remember praying with, we prayed with you guys, and God was, you were in a real transition, I, I think, and the faithfulness of God and through the years. And uh, I tell you, as you get older and you've got friends that you've had for decades, it, it gets better and better. You don't have to just be nostalgic all the time, but those long-lasting relationships are so valuable. And I appreciate the fact that we're a movement with loads of long-lasting relationships, at least among the older folks. And uh, some movements aren't that way. So um, I was asked to share um, about the role of prophets in raising up Ephesians 4 ministries or leaders. And um, I'd like to go to uh, Acts chapter 11 and take a look at the church in Antioch and uh, see what we can discover about that. This is the first place in the book of Acts where we actually, where prophets are mentioned. There's lots of prophetic things going on all the way through the book of Acts, but this is the first picture or little uh, glimpse we get to see of, uh, of, of um, prophets in action in the church in Acts. And so... I believe there's some uh, lessons here for us. I'm going to read beginning in chapter 11, verse 19, and, um, uh, and just read the story of the beginning of the Antioch church. Antioch was a big city and uh, a very highly multicultural, multiracial city. There were people there from literally around the whole known world in that city, and the church itself became very multicultural, multiracial. And uh, so we'll start at verse 19. The believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. And they preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. And, uh, and the power of the Lord was with them. And a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. When the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived, he saw the evidence of God's blessing and was filled with joy, and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and strong in faith. And many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch, and both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. 
It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Now during this time, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up in one of the meetings and predicted by the Holy Spirit that a great famine was coming upon the entire Roman world. This was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius, and that wasn't too much after that. So the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea, everyone giving as much as they could. This they did, entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. And then I'm just going to flip over to the next glimpse of this church in Acts chapter 13 and verse 1. And it says, Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch in Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Manaean, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, and the Holy Spirit said, Dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work for which I've called them. And so after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. And off they went on the first apostolic mission out into the nations of the world. Changed the world. What happened in that church? Changed the world. And so <clears throat> we're going to talk about this um, story a little bit, and uh, I'd like for us to just interact a little bit. So uh, the, the first thing I'd like to ask you is, and, and I'd like to have interaction and sharing, maybe you, your comments could be kept sort of short to leave room for several different comments, okay? But um, in this story, how is prophetic ministry introduced to the church at Antioch? How did the, the prophets wind up being in that church. Hmm? From Jerusalem, they want to they stick, came, stick around and see what was going on. They came, they came down from Jerusalem. How many were there? A number. Yeah. There were a number of them. It's interesting uh, that picture here we get of how a, these prophets came to the church in Antioch. First of all, the church um, in Jerusalem had sent down Barnabas to visit and see what was going on. He was so excited about what was happening, he stayed there and then got Saul to come, and they joined together. I think Barnabas was, well, we know that he became an apostle. So he was likely kind of one of those budding apostles, maybe you could say apostolic delegate, who was sent down, most likely by the apostles, to from the, obviously from the church in Jerusalem, to um, look in on what was happening and to do what he could to help them. And we do get the impression that this new, fresh church there in Antioch was very open to receiving outside people, outside leaders, to come in and speak to them. They were, it was fresh, it was Holy Spirit anointed, it was something brand new. We have a, a church made up of Jews and Gentiles, all together as one. And then, a little bit later, this, this team or company of prophets show up from Jerusalem, from the church in Jerusalem as well. And though it doesn't specifically say this, I think it's highly probable they were sent by the leaders, probably by the apostles, to visit and minister to that church. It would appear to me that right from the beginning, there was a sense that we need prophetic ministry coming into the churches. 
and there was obviously apostolic ministry coming into the churches in the stories that come before this with Peter and others going to, to the churches round about uh, in Judea. And so um, you have Agabus and this company or team of, of prophets that arrive at the church there in Antioch. What do you um, what, why, why do you think these prophets came as a, as a group? It's okay to just have an idea or a thought. We won't, we won't get too upset if it seems uh, odd, but we want to have a little bit of interaction here. So out here, some uh, anybody, um, what, what do you think's going on with this? Why a, a company or team of prophets? Safety and numbers. Safety and numbers. <laughs> That's pretty good. Say again. Yeah, so that they can confirm the prophetic with each other. And that's that's good. Could it be going back to the Old Testament schools of the prophets traveling together? I personally think so, yes. <laughs> but I, I think there's good reason. Here's something that looks like that. See, back in the Old Testament, you'll notice like, like a prophet like Samuel, especially when he was older, is we meet, meet up with him in the Bible, in the, in the story, with a school of prophets or a company of prophets around him. We have indications of that going on with other prophets, and we know it was going on with Elisha. Elisha is seen in the story of his life with this company or school of the prophets, depending on what translation you're looking at. And so, I think these, any, any more insight or a thought on that? Anybody have anything else? Prophetic teamwork. Prophetic teamwork. Yeah, <clears throat> right, exactly. And here in Antioch, and, and, and I'm, I, I would guess they probably got their idea from the stories of the Bible, but, but there was this also a kind of an accountability, as um, we heard there, a, kind of a, 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 a prophetic interaction that was important. There was immediate accountability because in the New Testament especially, we weigh prophecy. In the Old Testament, what did you do to a prophet who was proven to be a false prophet? You, yeah, you, you killed him. Because he was claiming to be hearing from God when very few people heard from God directly. Because very few people were filled with the Spirit in the Old Covenant. But in the New Covenant, everybody's supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we all become prophetic somehow because the presence of the Spirit is in fact prophetic. Always. And, and many other things too. So we can all prophesy, if you're filled with the Spirit, that that doesn't take away from the... And, and Terry has touched this and talked about it during our time here. It doesn't take away from the presence of actual prophets. In the New Testament, all could prophesy, yeah. Some prophesy, you know, once in a great while. Some prophesy more frequently. And some have a ministry of a prophet, which um, is um, we see in action here, and we can learn as we look at this maybe a little bit more. I think one of the things about this teamwork is that it, um, it, it actually discourages what I call the superstar syndrome. Does that make sense? 
a lot of singular public ministries fall into the trap of a superstar syndrome. They start to push around a reputation. And, uh, and that could certainly happen to prophets. There's, there, there's, there can be kind of a wow factor to, to, to prophecy and prophetic things. And, and, and it's easy to start pushing a reputation around and have to keep it going. And that leads to trouble. That just simply is an accident waiting to go happen. And it's not just prophets that fall into that. But they do fall into that. So it helps avoid the superstar syndrome. And I think because of the, 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 the model we get in the Old Testament of Samuel and a, a company of prophets around him, and, and then you have Elisha, a company of prophets around him, and there's other indicators in the Old Testament along those lines as well. It's probable that this Agabus who's mentioned and who has actually stepped out and, and brought a, a prophetic word, that the team may well have been a company of younger prophets. I can't prove that except from the model of the Old Testament, but they were collaborating and it would be likely, or at least highly possible, that Agabus is a, a more senior, developed, mature prophet, probably older. And, uh, and so he's mentioned here and he actually prophesies. I would, I would say this, this is just a passing comment on this, but Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, doesn't seem to like to waste ink. And so he, 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 he tells the story with a few words. And so we don't get, we get a pretty short prophecy here. There's a famine coming. I, I think maybe there was some more said that didn't get written down. I can't prove that. But we get the gist of it, don't we? That's all we really need is the gist. We don't have to hear every single thing. But maybe some of those other prophets chipped in and added to. That's what typically happens around where I go. <laughs> I mean, it's been happening here all week. <laughs> we, we get inspired by a word somebody brings and we find the Holy Spirit talking to us and we, we want to add a, another aspect. And I find that that is really kind of, I think, the Holy Spirit's way of doing prophecy most of the time. We, we prophesy, Paul says, in part. And I think that happens just about every time we open our mouths to prophesy. We give a, a portion, and then maybe somebody else gets another a portion, and, an, another, uh, and, and, it, and it actually rounds out the prophetic word more. So um, maybe that's probably what may have been happening here. So anyway, uh, you get this picture of a, 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 a company of prophets ministering together. And I think that is a wonderful model. The singular public ministry has been proving itself to be a big um, accident waiting to happen. And, and I, I don't want to start telling any horror stories, but we could all tell them, couldn't we? Of very high-profile public ministries. Not all, but quite a few. And you, you think, wouldn't, couldn't it probably, wouldn't it have been better if he'd have had some people around him that could really talk to him? And, and I know Terry's been sharing some really important things along those lines. So I won't I'll go over that anymore. But I think we get the picture here. Okay, another question. So there's a prophecy comes to the church at Antioch. What was the effect? What was the result of those prophets' visit and the prophecy they, that was brought? In the church, what was the result? What was the effect? In the light of this story, yeah. Action was taken. Yeah. What action? They took up an offering. 
to bring relief. Anything else? They believed the prophecy. Yeah, that's right. My guess was there was dialogue around the prophecy and the elders and leaders talked about it and this may not have all happened in an hour's time. Uh, so they, they, they said, we, we need to do something. What's, what are we going to do? Let's take up an offering and bring relief. And... Um, who 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 did they bring relief to? Brothers, what kind of brothers? Hmm? Jewish. Jewish brothers, people from Judea, because they were the hardest hit by the famine. That's one reason, anyway. Maybe not the only reason. Anything else? So I, my hearing is not great, so that's why I walk around and try to get close. But lift your voice <laughs> if you have anything to say more. Because it's all kinds of things. I find in these dialogue times, sometimes people say things that I thought, wow, I wish I'd have thought of that. Well, it's quite interesting. It's straight after the, the, church, the council in Jerusalem. And obviously they've heard all these Gentiles are getting saved. Quite possibly they sent them to check the church out. Oh, yeah. And, and they've heard Barnabas has just brought Paul. Yeah. And it may be that they've gone to check check it out. Happening. And if this hadn't have happened, then um, you know you see the connection. It could have been a breakaway church. Yeah. But actually, you know, they brought back in and they're connected with the Jerusalem. This was a highly unique thing happening in Antioch. Yeah. Nothing. Well, stuff like this had happened already with Peter and and, and Cornelius, but this was a widespread outbreak of the Spirit among Gentile people. And so you have Jewish background people and you have Gentile people in the same church. And there are all kinds of nationalities, backgrounds, races, language groups probably. Although Greek was commonly spoken by most everybody. But here's some things that, just in light of these observations, they, <clears throat> these, the, this prophetic ministry through this team of prophets and Agabus actually gave shape to the church. It shaped, it shaped the church. Um, and, and there's this, there, there are these, what we're, we, 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 we refer to in the light of the New Testament as apostolic foundations that are being strengthened by these prophets. You see, uh, the Bible in Ephesians, it talks about the foundation of apostles and prophets. You know, Ephesians chapter 3. Let me just read it to um, bring us to that thought. I, I'd like to pull it in right at this point. I'll just take it right from Scripture here. Ephesians chapter 3 and we'll just read uh, let me read um, verse where will I start? There's several things I could read here. I'll, I'll go with chapter... Let's do 3, 5. Sorry. Chapter 3, verse 5. We'll do, do that one. We could read quite a bit, but it says, um, God did not reveal this previously to previous generations. God's mysterious plan is what it says there. That this plan... This, this uh, God Himself revealed His mysterious plan to me, Paul says. As you read what I've written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now, but now, right here, now, by His Spirit, He has revealed it to His holy apostles and prophets. I wanted that verse because of the now word. Um, 
Many think that the only apostles and prophets being talked about were historic prophets, but that's not the tenor of what this says. These guys are living, breathing people right now. Other people in, in, in decades, uh, years, millennium past didn't get this. Now it's been revealed by apostles and prophets. These foundations. And there is something foundational about prophetic and apostolic ministry or prophets and apostles. And a foundation, I'd like to suggest to you that a foundation is being strengthened by these prophets. How so? Well, first off, and I'd like to say, let me make another comment. There is something really powerful about apostles and prophets working together. Uh, Ray has talked about how walk, uh, uh, being able to travel with Terry through the years and, and all the experience was hugely helpful. I could tell some of those same stories when early in our uh, life with New Frontiers, uh, we were in the same town in Columbia, Missouri for a year. And during that time, I had the privilege of getting to go with Terry to things that, that he was going to be doing, visiting churches. And we went out to India and, 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 and Dubai and places like that, Philippines and things like that with uh, Terry and Wendy. And, and I was learning a lot about Terry's way uh, and, and something I really needed. I learned, I, so I was on a learning curve but I also got to be part of the action. So, and I actually can say the same thing. When, when, I was, when we were together in these contexts, I found prophetic revelation was kind of on the uptick for me. I was, I was actually getting prophetic things more freely. And I think you were sharing this about the freedom, the sense of, of, of certainty or security in that relationship. And it was notable. And then after that, I had the opportunity of, of um, moving around with uh, John Lamferman, who has an ap uh, uh, apostolic, has been an apostle that we've enjoyed and have a very warm friendship with. And then Dave Devonish for a season, working into uh, the, the uh, Russian speaking world and also into the Middle East. And, 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 and I, I, I've come to realize it's really great for apostles and prophets to be together. It's really great. I could say that of Steve. We've gone out a time or two, and, and it, God was just with us, and it was a joy in northern England and places like that. Um, so you see this collaboration here with apostles and prophets. Now, there's a budding prophet there, uh, uh, you know, Barnabas is there, and now Saul is there, and they're, they're, they're on their way, but they probably were sent by apostles to get there. They weren't just a, a band of roving lone rangers or a group of people who wandered around the country, uh, you know, wherever they felt to go. I believe they were very strategically moving around. And so there's a... There's this ministry to the poor that emerges as a result. Is that a apostolic foundation? Remember the poor? Yeah. So there was something foundational about this. Now what is it? They probably all knew we need to remember the poor. But what happened, and I think this might be, I don't want to make, uh, too strong a statements because um, there there is a un kind of a uniqueness between apostles and prophets in some ways, but the work that's done is the same thing. It's foundational, or it's meant to be. Some some prophets who don't have this combination and work in their life, apostles and prophets together, tend to be people who move around with a prophetic gift, and the only way they know to use it is by going into a group and blessing individuals. But they're not doing much about strengthening and laying foundation in the church. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's kind of a standard thing that you find. A, a, a gift of revelation that is mostly used because there's they don't have many other um, they don't know what the options are. They just talk they give words to people. Maybe a highly developed kind of word of knowledge and prophetic, and uh, and that's that's that. So I'm not being critical, especially, but I think prophecy goes way beyond that in the in the New Testament, and it's about foundation laying. Well, how did these guys lay this foundation? And, and I think this might be kind of typical of prophets. They actually, by revelation, the, the apostles work by revelation too. But they bring revelation into the moment sometimes or into the actual situation, giving expression to an apostolic foundation in a specific way. And the outcome of the prophecy as short as it is in our New Testament, is that they actually gave, they gave application to remember the poor by the outcome, that the elders and we're all probably talking about this, taking up an offering for the brothers in Judea, in Jerusalem. So it gave specific application to apostolic foundation. Does that make sense? Now, there's another aspect to this, and I think it's even weightier, and that is they not only gave application to the caring for the poor as, a, as something foundational to our life together in, in Christ, but who did they serve? Jewish background believers. What's going on here? There's unity between Jewish background Christians and Gentile background Christians. There's unity between Christians who will not eat bacon or shrimp or things like that, and Christians who do eat bacon and shrimp and things like that. <laughs> now that, that may seem kind of humorous to us, but that was a serious problem for these people with their backgrounds. And... Um, and so what's going on? What foundation is being given clear, practical expression to by these prophets? One new man in Christ. One new man in Christ. And you had Gentile background believers taking up as much money as they could afford to give to bless the Jewish background believers up in Jerusalem and in Judea that were hit by the famine. One new man in Christ. And I think that's something that often happens when you combine apostolic ministry and prophetic ministry. Prophets may get specific application to a, a, an apostolic foundation. And, it, and so what, what is the difference between a, a, an apostolic foundation and a prophetic foundation? My answer would be none. No difference. No difference. But perhaps in its application, one helps the other to some degree. And, but, and put these things, help put these things, wheels on these, um, these foundational realities that need to be laid in every single church. Maybe I, I'll at this point just make a quick side comment about the difference between Old Testament prophets and New Testament prophets. And this is a short comment. There's a lot more to be said. But I think probably this, the, the, the difference that stands out to me the strongest between Old Testament prophets and New Testament prophets is that the prophets in the Old Testament in their relationship with God 
called themselves and everybody else to the law of Moses in relationship to God. They were more or less enforcers of the law of Moses in the Old Testament. What else was there? But now, in the New Covenant, these prophets are calling, are calling everybody into relationship with Christ. And one new man in Christ. Which is by far a better covenant, and Terry's convinced us all of that. And I'm so grateful for that. Because I grew up being called to the law of Moses as a young a kid in, in a legalistic church. And, and actually, they added to the law of Moses. Well, they made all kinds of laws. That if you don't keep, and Jesus had suddenly come because dispensationalism had come in great power in the 1950s when I was a kid growing up. And, and it was that Jesus could come any minute because now Israel is a nation. And they took that to be a fulfillment of prophecy, and now it's almost over. It's almost done. I, by the way, I won't get into eschatology, but that's a very poor, poor, poor eschatology. But the, the, uh, the, the, there was this constant warning, warning, warning. What should happen if you should be sitting in a movie theater tonight and Jesus would come back? What would happen to your soul? <laughs> And you know, I was scared to death. Honestly, and I, I promised God I'll never do it again. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I promise you I'll never do it again and walk out. And by Tuesday, I was back at it. Because the fear wore off. Well, I, I, I didn't mean to start that message. But, but these guys are getting people connected in very real ways to one new man in Christ, these prophets. And that, that gap, that, 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 that distance culturally is being broken down by how? By love, by people who care, by people who give their very best to try to serve their brothers who are in need. One new man in Christ. So, it's likely that this prophetic teamwork that happened there in Antioch, well, I, I think it's more than likely. It's, pro it's probably pretty clear here. This prophetic team that came to Antioch had something to do with releasing Ephesians 4 ministries. Why do I say that? Because the next scene, the next scene in Acts 13, what happens? There are prophets and teachers living in Antioch. And they're, they're the leadership. What happened here? Well, reading between the lines, the presence of prophets coming to them and ministering among them has a tendency to call out prophetic gifting in people who aren't moving in it yet and they're new in the Lord and the next thing you know you've got some prophets in the local church. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean gifting is catchy. That's why we need all these gifts. All these Ephesians 4 gifts can, in our churches. If you don't have any go out and look for some in another uh, in, in your fellowship or someplace and have them come. And as Terry was saying, sometimes reaching out for the gift that's in somebody even when they may not be exactly a carbon copy of what we are. Because they bring something. And so, the, I, I believe that the presence of these prophets that are now part of the church in Antioch has some connection to the prophets that have come and visited them. You see, the grace of God is upon people who carry a God-given gift or ministry to equip. That's what, we, that's what it says. 
He gave to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, to, to reproduce themselves and equip the church. And we could all use a little more prophetic equipping and a little more apostolic equipping, maybe a whole lot more. And we need some evangelists around to stir us up. I've been around a few evangelists, and the next thing you know, I'm out in the street somewhere passing out my personal trap. <laughs> you do that. <laughs> but anyway, um, and, and others. We had Lex Loisidis with us at one point back in, in Colombia, and he had us all with personal tracks. I mean, he rubbed off on everybody. So, we need these ministries. And these prophets had something to do with raising up Ephesians 4, other Ephesians 4 prophets, and very likely putting a fire under others in some other direction by the Spirit. And it was out of Antioch that the first apostolic team we see in the New Testament was sent out to the nations. Paul and Barnabas were sent out to the nations because of, in some way, prophetic ministry in the church and apostolic ministry and the rest, all the rest. I think I'm going to end with that. Um, as far as teaching goes, and uh, well, I'm, before we go further, I'd like to I'd like us to pray for just as a group, just pray as a group for everybody here. Not not that uh, I, we can all prophesy, and I'll bet you nearly everybody in the room has prophesied. Is that right? You most everybody has prophesied at least once, um, and if not, you can. Just listen, you know, and maybe talk to one of your uh, elders or leaders and, and get some input on that. But uh, I think God uses His body this way, and it's very common for us to bring words to people. Uh, I'm not trying to throw out a, any kind of guilt there at all. If you don't, uh, just let the Lord talk to your heart, and He might maybe give you a verse of Scripture or something to prophetically share in a meeting. Even if, it, even if prophecy doesn't stand up real strong in your life. But how many here feel that prophetic ministry is a primary aspect of your gifting as a member of the church? Could you stand? I want to just pray for these guys and gals, if there's any. It's for guys and gals, for everybody. That is. So, uh, why don't, uh, okay. Um, why don't we just, uh, those nearby, just reach out and extend your hand. And I just want to pray God's blessing on these guys and gals, ladies. I'm an American. I use some funny words. Lord Jesus, we come right now. We thank You for Your presence here by Your Spirit. We thank You to these that have stood up because we're, we need prophets. We need more prophets. And so, Lord, we want to say, would You bless them? Would You anoint them with greater freedom in revelation? Lord, we just pray. And, and not only that, Lord, we pray that there would be and the equipping and training of others through them, by their testimony, by their witness, by their example. And Lord, we pray that as maturity continues, though, and this is a very mature group here today, that they would uh, um, mentor others who are also stirred prophetically, but they're just needing some mentoring and experience with those that are down the road further. We pray your blessing, Lord, on them.
We pray your blessing, Lord Jesus. I, I, I'm just going to give a couple quick prophetic words. I, I want to pray for this friend, friend here all the way from Dubai. Thank you for Peter, Lord. Thank you for his years of faithfulness and the battles. Oh, Lord, thank you for him. Pete, I just believe that. I don't know if this is going on now. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised that it has gone on, but I believe I just see you with some younger prophetic people just spending some time, as we've already heard, in, in, in a casual friendship, but, but with, a, with a purpose to, um, to, to raise them up and give them place and give them understanding of the prophetic ministry. I just feel God's going to use you that way. I know there's lots of things that you're doing. And I think some of these things might be in other places. But I, I would just like to drop in the thought, maybe in some cases, there might be some younger ones that would be able to go with you and serve alongside and begin to learn your ways and begin to learn to move in the prophetic with greater boldness. I just want to leave that with you, and you'll need the Lord to show you how to do it, mm -hmm. or with whom and how to go for it. I just think it'll be something that God will begin to... Is that happening now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have a prophetic group in the church. Uh, yeah. Well, I just saw that ramping up somehow. Mm. And um, I just see some equipping going on mm. of other pro prophetic people mm. through you and those that you're working with. Mm. Thank, you, Thank you, Lord. And that may apply to others here, too. I think it probably applies to most of you who are standing some way or other. I wanted to give that to Peter. To Come, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Um, is Mike in here? There you are! <laughs> um, I think I, I just... <clears throat> are you standing right now? <laughs> that's what I thought. That, that's what... It, no. I just see an increase of prophetic mantle on you, if I could use that kind of language. I see it, I see it ramping up and becoming increasingly incisive. Not just details, but actually with a kind of clarity that goes right to the heart of things. I think you've seen that. You know what that looks like, for sure. But I see that increasing upon you, and I believe it has to do with seeing people come into the purposes of God who are new and young at times, and then also whole churches, whole churches. Maybe something like what we read about here in the Antioch church. I see you doing things that really um, bring some people through into a prophetic release in areas of their lives and churches coming through to uh, gripping, ga really getting, getting hold of apostolic prophetic vision. I see that increasing. I see it developing in you. And I really feel that you're going to actually be used by the Lord to give some um, prophetic strategies for unlocking doors into regions beyond. Prophetic strategies. And, 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 and it is all in, the, in kind of this team concept. So, Lord, I just want to pray for my brother, Lord. Thank you for the work that's going on. Thank you for his years in you and faithfulness. And, Lord, we just pray that there's, it's almost like a new dimension of what you already know. Whoa! Thank you, Lord. Amen, Jesus. Thank you, Father. 
Thank you, Father. Now, if you relate to some of those words there, I'm not going to go through the whole group here, but it, you know, God's going to talk to you. And maybe some of these words that have been shared, you say, you know, I, I can picture that in my life. Take it. That's what the Lord does sometimes. And if you feel like it's speaking into your heart, take it. Hmm. I'd like to. Um, you can sit down if you want. Um, uh, now you've you, you've stood, and we'll let you sit down. Um, I jotted some things down as I was praying for different ones, and uh, John Evans. Um, I feel like that, that there's. Uh, I just saw um, the other. Well, I, maybe early this morning, I saw the Lord just pouring bottle of oil over you, an increase of this um, anointing to function as a real pastor teacher, if I could, does that, is that okay for me to say that, that kind of, I mean, uh, I know you, I know there's all kinds of things going on in your life, but I do see you as a real, a gifted teacher, is that, is that yeah, close yeah. enough? I'm not trying to put you in a box, but I just I felt like that almost prophetically God is going to begin to give you things um, out from your study, out from your teaching gift that's going to actually be revelatory in preparing training for a new and younger generation. And I just felt like God's going to give you some, it's almost like helping people find a track to run on in the younger generation. And, they're, and, and actually how to understand their Bible and how to get rooted in to His Word and biblical worldview. Because that younger generation in their teens and 20s, you know, they're pretty confused as a group, but they're hungry for something. I'm running into that all over the place. I'm running into kids in their teens and 20s that are hungry for God, wanting to serve God, and wanting to go for God, but they need, some, they need something to get a hold of to see that where, the, where, the, where the pathway is and begin to even understand what the Bible has to say about who they are. In, in probably ways we're not used to. There's such confusion, gender confusion and all that. And I just felt like God's going to give you almost a revelatory uh, plan of action, if I could say it that way, is what would be helpful. And you may collaborate with us. It may not be a lonely, isolated thing, but I, I just felt like God's going to give you that. And I'd like to pray for you. Does that make sense? I'm doing it. You're doing it. I'm Doing it now. Well, then take it as a confirmation. There must be more. Well, I believe there is more. But Lord, we thank you for John. We, we thank you, God, for what's going on in his life. We thank you, Lord, for the, the calling upon him, among other things, to, be, to teach clear a doctrine and, and, and biblical thinking. And, and I pray, Lord, that you would use him, Lord, among young people, Lord, especially, Lord, where there's such great confusion and also hearts that are hungry. Lord, our hearts go out to this younger generation that is, um, is coming forth out of their teens into their 20s, Lord, and, and, and even older, that would just need and, and, and love to be instructed gr through, through gracious, loving teaching the way of the Lord and the paths to walk, the sure paths of the Lord. And I just pray you bless John and others like him, Lord, in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, I think I'm going to finish right there.